We're going to hear briefly from Dr. Uh, Matthew White, and he's going to give us the past, present, and future of Twin Grows. Thank you. Briefly. Say thank you to the MC. She said we're briefly again under her breath. I know. I know. I know. I know the mic over time. Uh, I do thank this committee uh, for putting this together, especially whoever decided to have it indoors. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It is an honor uh, to take this opportunity to say something about Juneteenth and the men and women who built this community, um, especially when I found out they were eating that toad frog soup. Uh, but it's wonderful hearing people talk about their ancestors and their family history. Uh, I do genealogy and family history research, and about nine years ago I was able to help uh, Miss Albessi Thompson work on some things for the Ozark Foothills African American History Museum. I learned a lot about this community. I've uh, been associated with Twin Girls for several years. I married a lady from Center Ridge, uh, from the Hawkins family that was mentioned earlier, and she's, of course, got a bunch of kin folks in this community. And I've uh, been to plenty of programs at Zion and Solomon Groves over the years, so I feel connected. But when uh, Ms. Thompson called and asked me to speak at this Juneteenth, I said, well, surely there's somebody more qualified. She said, well, don't worry, there's 10 other speakers. <laughs> I said, okay, I, I can be one of them, but, uh, because there are people who, who know a lot more, of course, about the community and, and about the experience that our forefathers went through. Uh, but it, it is nice to be able to talk to you today about uh, the past, the present, and the future. But when she first called me, she said, talk about the migration. So most of what I'm going to talk about is the migration. Uh, Juneteenth is, of course, a celebration of enslaved African people in America finding out about emancipation and about freedom. And these formerly enslaved people now had an opportunity to strike out on their own following the Civil War. Uh, and as told today, the founders and early African-American settlers in this area, they came from all over the South. A lot of them came from Tennessee. The Thompsons, the Walkers, the Tyus family, the Jones, the Ely's, the Waters, the Owens, the Dillard, the Falls, the Bonds, and the Smith families all came from Tennessee. This area. Many came from Mississippi, the other Walkers, the Canes, the Cummings. Some came from Georgia, the Floods, the Nesbits, the Dooleys, and some came from South Carolina, the Fields, the Evans, the Rileys. But we also had the Georges from Louisiana, the Goffs from Kentucky, the Atkins from Virginia. So the, all over the South, people came to this area. And a lot of them did stop and stay in Memphis. And I think it was mentioned earlier about how Memphis was kind of a crossing over point for a lot of people. Some of them did fight in the Civil War. There's a, a good marker out there at the museum about George Water, George Walker, and William Bond, who all fought in the Civil War, literally fighting for freedom. Uh, and even after slavery ended in 1865, it's not like they came over right away. Uh, formerly enslaved people didn't have a lot to start with. They had to spend years working just to to save up the resources and the money to move. And as the gentleman read earlier, it wasn't easy to get out even then. Um, families had to be reunited, uh, families that had been split up. And, and still they were dealing with uh, legalized systemic discrimination during the Reconstruction. Uh, the period right after slavery, though, was also a positive period in many ways. As people began to experience freedom, they were able to seek education, in some places able to vote draw strength from their churches. We also found out there were minstrel shows and baseball games going on. So, uh, things were not all that bad, but the main thing is people organized. They got together, they got back together, and they organized. And organizing is what helped people get uh, from all those other places here to Twin Groves in Damascus, Arkansas. Some of them got homestead grants. It was mentioned earlier, they're called, sometimes called railroad grants from the federal government. Some came and just bought land. Uh, and many would travel together in family groups, wagons, loads of people coming uh, or, or like uh, some would come and then a month later the next wave would come. Uh, and coming from Memphis to Solomon Grove doesn't seem like a lot today, but there were no GPSs, there were no automobiles, they didn't have I-40 and Highway 65, uh, and a lot of places were not safe to stop at. That's right. And so uh, it was not an easy journey, but they made it here. Mm -hmm. These settlers, uh, not themselves far removed from the pains and horrors of slavery, came to Faulkner and Conway County, to Damascus and Solomon Grove and Holly Springs and Morris Mountain and Mountain View, seeking a better life and new opportunities and, and land. And when they got here, uh, you know, the land wasn't ready. It wasn't like when you buy a house in a subdivision. <laughs> they, they had to clear the land. Uh, you could get a railroad grant. It's called a homestead grant, but it's not like you just filled out paperwork and got it. You had to clear the land, document the improvements you made to the land. If you ever look at the files, um, you know, like 40 or 50 pages where you had to go through and document all you had done to that land. It would take years before you actually owned the land, uh, but you had, to, you had to build it and improve it. Uh, George Walker was mentioned. He got a land grant for 160 acres right here in this area where we are today. 
uh, close by, Richard uh, Bird Ely got one for 90, uh, 80 acres. Silas Owens got one for 80 acres. So once you homesteaded the land for so many years, you documented that, and your neighbors had to come. And they had to drive down to Little Rock or wherever it was and testify, yes, this is the person who improved the land. But it, it was a big ordeal to get that land. So I don't want you to think they just rolled over here one day and picked it up. <laughs> um, they built it, and they built it together with neighbors. And they built. They built homes, churches, like uh, Mount Zion, Zion Grove, Solomon Grove, nearby Hopewell, Mountain View, Holly Springs, Friendship. He named a bunch of them from uh, Cypress Creek. They built schools like Bailey's Chapel, the Nesbitt Schoolhouse, the One Room Log Schoolhouse at Solomon Grove. They built businesses. They formed lodges. They built roads. And what there weren't roads and wells out here. These people had to build it. And while they were doing that, they built communities. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, this part of Faulkner County, and if you go over to Conway County, was filled with many vibrant rural communities of formerly enslaved people and their children who had migrated to this area in search of a better life. And these communities were connected. They were connected through church. They shared the same pastors for one thing. They were connected through church. Right. They were connected through marriages. You want to know how, why somebody's your cousin three different ways? It's because there weren't that many families to choose from. Um, and so, and I'm not, it wasn't incestuous, but you know, you only had so many families to choose from. Uh, so it wouldn't be weird for a brother, two brothers to go marry, you know, two sisters from the same family. And they built those communities uh, in the generation after slavery. And then another generation or two, we went through what's called the Great Migration, where a lot of their children and grandchildren left the rural South, and they went to places, uh, first of all, for economic opportunities, but also to escape Jim Crow and segregation. They went to places like Detroit, Omaha, Kansas City, Chicago, yeah. California, That's right. That's right. doing what their grandfathers and parents had done, looking for a better life, yeah. looking for opportunities. But some stayed here. They stayed here and continued living on this land, attending these churches and schools and passing on the traditions that had been brought to them from the Deep South and even from Africa. They stayed and they built dairy farms and masonry businesses and a sawmill. And something a lot of folks don't realize is, too, uh, the schools didn't always go the full time. A lot of time they would send their young people off to Union Chapel, Menifee, North Little Rock, as far as Pine Bluff, just to finish school. Uh, they called them boarded. They boarded them. Uh, and then a hundred years after the original settlers in 1991, uh, Queen Groves was incorporated as a city. And so a lot of those people are still with us, but many of them have passed on. Mm -hmm. uh, I was asked to mention specifically two people from that time period who helped with the incorporation. Arlene Lasker, who helped get the funding for the roads, and William Lee, who helped map out Queen Groves. So we appreciate their efforts. But we know there are a lot of people that work to make that happen. Okay, it wasn't just Al Bessie Thompson, although I hear she did most of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there, are a lot of, there are a lot of people who work together to make that happen. But we're all indebted to, I'm on the last page, we're all indebted to those early settlers today who came from bondage and made, seemingly made something out of nothing. But they, did, they had more than nothing. They had their faith, they had their family, their determination, their culture, their history, their frog soup. And they were gonna, they were gonna need it because it was not an easy road. And I, I'm surprised it hasn't been mentioned already. But the people that settled up in Damascus, so they were literally run out and they had yeah. to come down and settle to Zion Grove. Um, it, it was not an easy trip. Some people say we should forget about the past. It's too painful. Focus on the positive part. Don't talk about all the bad stuff with Juneteenth. Just make it a, a cultural celebration. Yeah, I get that, but. They're, the struggle was real. That's right. And we can focus and talk about the good things, but it helps to also know about the bad things. That's and it right. helps to know right. the stories of our ancestors, mm -hmm. our country, our community, our family, where we came from. Mm -hmm. And we've got to tell their stories. Yeah. You know, census records and land records, those are always going to be here. But the stories and the heritage, the things you heard talked about today, right. we've got to pass those on. Yes. Or else they disappear. Yes. Every time somebody, you think yeah. I've heard the saying, you might have heard it. Every time an old person dies, a library burns. Yeah. Everything they know. You think about a gentleman earlier, they mentioned he was 90 years old. Think about everything he saw. Yeah. The people he knew when he was little. That's right. The stories he heard. I'm sure there were some. Um, we've got to pass that on. The Ozark Foothills uh, History Museum here does a great job of that, but it's up to each of us to continue the legacy and keep the stories of our ancestors alive. You can look and see today that many of their descendants are enjoying the fruits of their labor. They've got good jobs, nice homes, families full of love. They can live and work towards their dreams. The future is bright for this community and its offspring, but just as those founders worked and sought a better life and didn't accept anything less, 
We must continue to strive and celebrate where we've come from as we stood on the shoulders of these giants. Let's continue to make the most of our present to create a future for those who are on the way. Let's honor their stories and the legacy this Juneteenth and forevermore. Yeah. Yeah. All right. yeah.